husband runs the farm for his aunt, Adelaide Harris. We have six children, four girls and two boys, and they range from the age of 23 to 10. Most of the people around us are engaged in farming. I guess life will go on as usual around here. Adolf Hitler has built Germany into a powerful war machine. The Germans have continued their march, crushing Denmark, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, Belgium, Norway, and France. By June of 1940, the United Kingdom stands alone against Hitler. Italy has joined forces with Germany. Germany, Italy, and Japan have formed an alliance known as the Axis. The United States, United Kingdom, China, and the Soviet Union are the major powers fighting the Axis. They are known as the Allies. I know the United States is beginning to build up its forces. Some of the boys from Ransomville have entered the service. However, our country is staying out of the war. We gather around... I lost my place already. <laughs> we gather around our radio. Yeah, I know. There it is. Excuse me. <laughs> if you had a boy overseas, you'd be as nervous as me. <laughs> we gather around our radio to hear the news off, but we continue our usual life in Ransomville. President Roosevelt has announced the neutrality of the United States after the invasion of Europe in 1939. Most of the people in the states feel we should stay out of World War II. I agree. It's so far away, and our boys would have to go overseas. 1940. The Chinese are fighting the aggression of Japan in Southeast Asia. To force the Chinese to surrender, Japan decides to cut off supplies from Southeast Asia. They also want the rich resources of this region. The United States opposes this expansion and cuts off vital exports to Japan. The Japanese industries rely heavily on petroleum, scrap metal, and other raw materials from the United States. Tension is on the rise after Japan seizes the rest of Indochina in 1941. President Roosevelt has barred the withdrawal of Japanese funds from American banks. General Tojo becomes Premier of Japan in October of 1941. Tojo and other military leaders begin to realize that the United States Navy has the power to block Japan's expansion in Asia. On December 7, 1941, Japan attacks Pearl Harbor in Hawaii without warning. This attack is a great success for Japan. On December 8, the United States, Canada, and the United Kingdom declare war on Japan. This is where our story begins. I'm very concerned that the United States has officially ended the war. My husband and I have to take our son, Willard Harris, to the draft board in New Bay. He turned 22 on his birthday on February 5th, 1942. Mother and father drove me from our home in Ransomville, New York, to the draft board in Newfane in our Model A Ford Coupe. The rest of us, the, the inductees and I, got on a bus that took us to Fort Niagara Induction Center in Youngstown, New York. At Fort Niagara, we were given our winter uniforms from the skin out and a big, heavy overcoat. They did not give us any toilet articles. Those had to be purchased from the PX, except for the few things I had brought from home. I brought my Norton camera made lockboard with me. I had it when I was in high school in Wilson, New York. Most of the pictures I took in the Army were taken on R&R. &R. The pictures were real small. They also had to go into the movie theater at the fort for an orientation film. That's where I was. After two or three days, we were put on a bus and taken to Whirlpool train station in the falls. We boarded a train and headed for Camp Lee in Virginia. There were four of us from this area. A houseman from Newfane, Clyde Jacobs from Tuscora Indian Reservation, and Roy Campbell from Ransomville and myself. Camp Lee is located outside of Pitts Petersburg, Virginia. It's a medical training camp. We were medics. The other three guys went to the 4th Medical Battalion. I got assigned to the 12th Infantry Regiment Medical Detachment. This is a very old regiment. The 12th used to be stationed at all Fort Niagara during the Revolution. Here we got our shots. I'm being trained to drive an ambulance. We went out by Richmond, Virginia through Appomattox. We drive on the roads like a little convoy. Falls 
with Aunt Marion and Uncle Effie. Aunt Marion needs help around the house. Aunt Marion was getting too tired with her job and housework too. We're expecting our family for dinner tomorrow night. I'm planning to return to help your mother with the white cross work at church. We are cutting out hospital gowns, dresses, and aprons. We went to the Rose Show after church at the Buffalo Municipal Auditorium. It was wonderful. The snow has begun to melt, but these March winds do blow. Kenneth is working for Erwin Campbell. He has over 200 acres of fruit. I am proud of you. Try to take things as they come, and don't, don't try to get out of the hard and difficult. <clears throat> I have always liked your smile and spirit. Tonight, we're going to the high school for the home defense program. Aunt Marion is working on a plan to notify the deaf of air raids. Your father wrote his letter last night, but I was so sleepy I couldn't keep my eyes open. We got your record today and we can't wait to hear it. Where did you record it? Your watch just came back today. Do you want me to send it to you? Yes, I get your letter sooner when by air mail. I think as long as you are well and all right, why don't you send them free? Unless you, excuse me, I keep losing my place when I have to call. Unless I call you, would you rather send them air mail? I want to start the garden this week. I have head lettuce and a dozen cabbages already. Roger Plain is at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Private Roy Campbell is with the second evac hospital at Fort Devens, Massachusetts. Vaughn is dear where you are, and his father said he might look you up. The government has claimed 75 acres of land <coughs> for the United States Army, bordering Porter Center Road, <coughs> Lux Road, along Bomber Road, to Creek Road, for a TNT factory. Dad has been working a lot of hours at Lake Ontario Ordnance, working putting up fencing. He has to work from midnight to 8. Stanley P. came in and wanted him to go out and get his team and drill. Then he got a load of fertilizer for him. It is now 4.14 p.m. Your father registered yesterday. I will close and write in a day or two. Ruthie. <laughs> William, sorry to hear you were moved away from your friends, but you will like new ones and probably like them just as well. Boy, I just got back from uptown and ever was I scared. Some man was drunk and acting awful. I had just gotten past the post office when I heard someone say, huh. I rode just as fast as I could all the way home. I hardly looked where I was going. Excuse the writing, but I am still jittery. Who is this Baxter girl from the North Town of Wanda, anyway? Bill, I saw her address on a piece of paper in your room. <laughs> <laughs> Never you mind this Baxter. <laughs> we are learning to treat people, too. We do not have any drugs, just how to pick them up and bandage them. We have practice runs where some people are victims and we treat them. We will be at Camp Lee for three to six months. I got my GI insurance while I was there. We were allowed to go to Richmond for a weekend. It was about 15 miles on US-1. We rode there in a truck when an officer, with an officer to accompany us. One Sunday afternoon, I went to see an opera with Mario Lanza. Most of the time, it was training, and more training, and no fun. From there, we went to Camp Gordon, Georgia. This was a huge camp, probably 100,000 acres. The 4th Motorized Division was there. We had more training and ambulances driving, and we had to learn to drive Jeeps and command cars, too. I got here in late summer. We had a lot of hikes to go on. I remember one in particular. It was a 30-mile forced march. It was summertime, and 103 degrees. We had to carry a full pack and extra shoes. The only water and food we had was what we carried, weighing 30 pounds or more. You had to hike this in eight hours. <laughs> well, I was one of the lucky ones. I made it. We had night marches as well as day marches. It was cooler at night, but no better. Sometimes we had to 
a strip pack on. That is minus a bedding roll. And area? Yes, I can do it. Okay. We were so glad to get your letter. That was some hike that you had, and you must be in good condition to do it. I think I'd be one of the ones that falls out and takes a ride in the ambulance. <laughs> Uncle Effie is taking first aid and had a test the other night. He is worried he didn't, he didn't pass. It's rather hard to start studying again at age 40. <laughs> I hope he passed as he signed up as an air raid warden, and first aid is a must. There was another man killed at the TNT the other day. He was thrown 17 feet when he came in contact with a live wire. We have not been to Ransomville for a while. Your sister Betty is home, and I hope she has found a job she likes. I expect to get your money belt this week. One of the boys in the office is going to get it for me. He says he knows the best kind. Take care of yourself. Well, we had a lot of medical training here too by our doctors. We also have to wear steel helmets and crawl on our bellies, sometimes with ammunition over our heads. We never know what is live and what isn't. Most of the time, it isn't live, just the sound of the guns. We have to carry a gas mask too. One time they used real gas. Nothing that would hurt us. We have to be able to take the mask off and on. My eyes would water, so I'm pretty sure it's tear gas. We went on maneuvers in North and South Carolina with the motorized division. We rode in trucks and got on KP and all that stuff. Everyone had to take a turn. There were night hikes near Fort Sumter. Sometimes the officers would go ahead and set up yellow blue forces and come back and tell us. I fell asleep, pack and all, right on the road. The others did too, just waiting. We were on maneuvers for about a month. I never really got any good sleep until we got back to our <coughs> barracks. They're trying to show us what war is like. Sometimes it seemed real, and sometimes not. After we finished maneuvers, we went back to Camp Gordon, Georgia. Our medical division was at the tail end of a convoy. We were in Columbia, South Carolina when the head jeep with the Commander General was back at the camp in Georgia, 150 miles away. That's how long the column was. I was on Route 1 from Columbia, South Carolina to Ken Gordon, Georgia. A savage five-month battle for Stalingrad begins in late August 1942. Hitler has ordered his army to stay on and fight the Russians. The Soviet troops counterattack in mid-November. Within a week, the German army is trapped. The Luftwaffe promised to supply the army by air, but few supplies land. Each day, thousands of German soldiers freeze or starve to death. February 2, 1943, the last Germans surrendered at Stalingrad. In the spring of 1943, at Camp Gordon, I had surgeries for two ruptures, one on either side and at two, and at two different times on the 4th Division Headquarters Hospital. The good thing is, is, they sent me home for two or three weeks each time. It was good to have Willard at home. I've been busy cleaning. I painted the plaster in the kitchen so it looks real clean, except for the linoleum, and that is about worn out. We have some new, some new linoleum in the back room. I also painted the floors in the dining room and living room when I, when I cleaned them. I still have to get a rug for the dining room soon. We still do not have quite enough money for it. Your father had to pay the interest on the mortgage. The garden is growing, but will be late this year. Everybody is well around here. Betty has had several letters from Roger, and he sent her $25 for her birthday. I hope you got the last Ransomville school paper. Anything you want, let me know, and I will try to get it for you. From Camp Gordon. The whole 4th Motorized Division was moved to Fort Dix, New Jersey for more training. We were moved by train. The troops and coaches and the vehicles and equipment and flat cars. It was pretty much more of the same medical training, but no maneuvers. After the fact, we were told that the German spies had been watching the 4th Division in training, and the officers had been trying to outmaneuver them. Hi, Billard. I have enclosed 
enclosed a letter and the nosy news for you. I was not going to mail the paper to you, but Mom said I should. I passed all of my exams at school and my grades were good. I mowed the front yard today. I hope you read in the paper, paper that Miss Betty Harris started working at the TNT on Monday the 14th. She works at the main gate and is very pleased with her job. She works in the cafeteria and canteen too. She has blisters on her feet already. I hope you liked my artist corner. Send me any ideas you might have. Fort Dix was near Philadelphia, so we got quite a few weekend passes to go there. There are USO shows in Camp 2. When I entered the service, I made $21 a month. Some senator from South Carolina got a raise to $50 a month. Then the officers told us we should send some of our money home. We barely have enough to get by. In fact, I have to send home for money. <laughs> we went back to Camp Gordon, Georgia, but no training there. We were sent to Camp Gordon, Johnston, in the Panhandle, Florida. We stayed for two to three weeks for amphibious training. I learned to swim in the Gulf of Mexico. We had to be able to swim 50 feet, far enough to get away from a ship and not be sucked down a draft. This was in case a ship got torpedoed and we had to go overboard. Camp Gordon Johnston was on land owned by the DuPont family. Another thing we did in Florida was go out to Dog Island and practice with landing craft. We got off on the island carrying everything over our heads. I didn't have to worry about getting a gun wet. I didn't have one. <laughs> Medics don't carry guns. The Red Cross on our helmets was for our protection. <laughs> there was an international agreement that said no one could fire at us. I was one of the lucky ones. Medics, uh, you know, there was an international agreement there after all. I carried, all I carried were two medic packs that held bandages, compresses, etc. in them. They were waterproof. We learned mostly how to stop bleeding, making tourniquets out of everything and anything. Vehicles, jeeps, tanks that were used for landing and actual invasion had to be waterproofed. Artillery too, but this wasn't done until we got to Europe. Heavy guns were transported on LCM, well, land craft medium. There were, these were larger than landing craft. Your sister Betty received some sad news today about Roger Plain, her fiance. He was killed on July 29, 1943, in North Africa. There is a great deal of sadness in town, as Roger was Dr. Plain and Mrs. Plain's son and well known in town. Betty, of course, is inconsolable. During the Willard's time in the Army, he came home a few times. He went by train to the Grand Central Station, took the subway to New York City Central Station, and a taxi to La Guardia Airport. He flew on a DC-3, and it took a, about two hours flight to fly to Buffalo and cost $20 one day. There was no one to meet me in Buffalo because no one knew exactly when I was coming in. Also, there was gas rationing. Mom was in Roswell Park Center Hospital in Buffalo. Dad had only A gas ration coupons. The farmers in Ransomville gave O.B. Goodfellow their extra coupons so Dad could get enough gas to get to Buffalo. For those of you who don't know, O.B. ran a gas station across from the American Legion. I took a bus from Buffalo to Niagara Falls, and then I took Les Schultz's bus to Ransomville. He ran a commuter bus from Ransomville to Niagara Falls during the war. I don't remember Mom being home much when I was on leave. She was in the hospital a lot. Finally, we're shipped out. It took us five to six days to cross the Atlantic Ocean in the biggest convoy ever to cross at one time. Everywhere you looked. There were ships as far as you could see. I was on the Europa, a prized German ship captured in World War I. Our whole regiment was on it, packed in like sardines in a can. We were all scared to death. The Missouri was out in front with destroyers, sub chasers, and aircraft carriers. 
the French had sent their USS Normandy over to the US for safekeeping, and it was being used in the convoy as a troop ship. So was the Queen Elizabeth from England. <coughs> they went to Torpedo Junction where German U-boats were lurking and landed in Liverpool, England, because so many men landed at once, we had to be sent to various places all over England. I rode on a train to Exeter, in the Moors, that is, where I spent Christmas, 1943. My barracks was located up on a hill, and I had to carry my duffel bag with all my belongings in it, up the hill. May 21st, 1944. Aunt Nellie has come to help me with the spring cleaning. It sure is nice to have her here with me. It has been so wet we are unable to plant the garden, and it's already May. Uncle Effie is able to go out for rides in the car after his surgery. He's been laid up for a long time. Dad hopes to put in a bathroom downstairs. That will make it easier for me. <coughs> there are not too many men left in town except for a few teenagers. They are even taking them now. Our man is home from the South Pacific. I've not heard from you for a while. Write me soon. It is time for dinner over here. I think it must be after nine over there. I am right to let you know I am all right. Nearly every day we are issued some bread and coffee to eat with our K rations. I suppose by now Kenneth Moss must be must have his commission in the Air Corps. The other day I rode him in Arkansas. I was glad to hear Betty is going out with Don Smithson. He sure is a nice fellow. The Red Cross was here to give us coffee and donuts. It was good to hear someone speak English. Say hi to all the neighbors for me. We stayed here about six months. Mostly, we take hikes in the area to keep in shape and wait, and wait, and wait. There were no USOs. But other than that, we were confined to the area. No traveling around. Every night, we sit by the radio for the latest news on the war. We are so worried about Willard and pray for our safety. Finally, after six months, we leave Exeter and travel by train to Southampton, England. General Eisenhower was there to greet us all personally. Lieutenant Colonel Teddy Roosevelt, Jr., our assistant division commander, was there too. They loaded us on landing craft, LCMs. We were scheduled to cross the English Channel on that day, June 5th. But the water is way too rough. The boats were not going under the waves instead of over. So they took it slow and maneuvered the craft around the 4th Infantry Division and arrived at Mitchell Point offshore from our landing spot in Normandy on the coast of France on June 6, 1944 at 6 a.m. Some of the boats got it from the German U-boats. We could see them blow. The LSTs had landed ahead of us and unloaded troops so they sank the LSTs to make a harbor so our bo other boats could land. We were shaken in our boots, scared to death and nowhere to go to stay away. It was about 9 a.m. when we went on to Utah Beach. We made a right turn to down to Cherbourg and then back up to Utah. Normandy was sunk in Cherbourg Harbor on purpose so no one could use it. We went over on a British landing craft. The driver got us across one sandbar, but not the second one. He dropped the ramp in three feet of water. The engines and everything were underwater, but it was okay. Everything had been waterproofed. The stacks were up in the air for exhaust and venting, so the engines could run even underwater. Jeeps and equipment lashed to them, and some of them floated away. I was attached to the 12th Infantry Anti-Tank Company. We had 57 millimeter guns pulled by half tracks. They landed okay because they were heavy. The captain in our company was leading a jeep and the equipment wasn't lashed well enough and it was floating away. But not the jeep. It made it okay. My medic equipment made it okay. It lasted until my first R&R when they resupplied it. We took <laughs> five to ten minutes to go ashore. We ran like hell to get away from the beach. We had surprised the Germans in the pillboxes. The Germans had guessed that we were coming across from Dover, England, 
and it was the shortest route, only two, 20 miles. We had outmaneuvered them. The ship had landed before we, well, the ship had landed before we did was actually a battleship. It came up and broadsided the concrete pillboxes and guns and the Nazis in them. The ship couldn't really destroy them, and, uh, and it ma couldn't make a direct hit. Our air support was from the 101st and 82nd Airborne. Our ground troops did find a way to destroy them. They used a tank with a bulldozer on the front. The tank, along with flamethrowers, covered up the pillboxes, and that ended the pillboxes <coughs> and the Nazis. The beaches and barriers are railroad irons and fencing. We had to wait for these to be blown up by the combat engineers. Things worked out as planned, but a lot of men lost their lives that day. We medics, we couldn't help <laughs> any of them. They were long gone. We were lucky we made it. We carried a folding shovel with us. We had to dig a foxhole and get right in it. We kept running inland and digging a new foxhole again and again. We got to France a ways. That was the longest day. We couldn't rest and it was raining too. We couldn't lie down, just catch a nap in the foxhole. The captain came around at night and told us not to smoke. A buddy of mine came out and arms reached for me, lit up a cigarette, and he got shot. I couldn't do anything for him. He was shot right between the eyes. We at home knew what was happening was from Life magazine. Ernie Pyle, a famous war correspondent, was with Willard's group all through the war. June 1944. Good to know you are safe in a safe spot behind the lines. I guess those fresh eggs in France tasted good to you after the powdered eggs in England. We all have had some things from the garden to eat. Dad has started to build a fireplace. 